you very much, Jamil. I'm, I'm most grateful to, uh, to be invited here. I'm grateful to fall for the book and for the Center of Global Islamic Studies. Um, I will, um, uh, if you don't mind, I'll read out my talk and hope it won't be too boring. I'll try to be more animated during the question answer session, if I can, though since I'm severely jet lagged, I hope Jamil, you will prod me awake if I fall asleep while standing here. Um, let me then begin. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about Osama bin Laden's demise had to do with the global response it generated, or rather did not. The Pakistani government, we know, was in private both embarrassed by the inability of its security forces to find a man who had apparently been living for years in a suburb of the capital, and afraid that it might be accused of harboring bin Laden in Abbottabad. In public, however, Pakistan's government joined its military and people in condemning what they saw as America's infringement of their sovereignty in launching a covert operation against Al-Qaeda's founder. The, this reaction, in other words, included no popular demonstration of support for Osama bin Laden and little regret about his death. Indeed, even the posters of bin Laden uh, that were at this point being sold in many Pakistani cities indicated that his popularity had been disconnected from the cause he represented. Found as they often were beside boxes of Barbie dolls and photographs of heavily made up starlets from Lollywood, as the Punjabi film industry based in Lahore is known. Osama bin Laden then seems to have become one icon among many others in a consumer society. The reaction to bin Laden's death in the rest of the Muslim world was, if anything, more subdued than Pakistan's. And even countries like Spain and Britain which had themselves been the victims of Al-Qaeda's terrorism in the recent past, saw no popular demonstration of satisfaction at his killing. Only in the United States was there an upsurge of patriotic feeling after the event, one that seemed so extraordinary in the circumstances that global interests soon focused on what was happening in the streets of Washington rather than Abbottabad. And so it appeared as if Osama bin Laden now attracted global attention primarily because of his infamy in the US. But in addition to demonstrating Al-Qaeda's loss of support in the Muslim world, a subject to which I shall return, this Americanization of the response to bin Laden's demise illustrates the disintegration of Al-Qaeda's global profile along with that of the war fought against it. Indeed, I want to argue here that despite the great transformations it has undoubtedly wrought, the war on terror failed to create either a new global order or even a new global politics in the wake of the Cold War. Now, the Cold War is important in the narrative of militancy, not only because Al-Qaeda emerged from its last great battle in Afghanistan. Remember, this is where all these chaps came from, right, from the anti-Soviet jihad supported by the United States, uh, Britain, and Saudi Arabia, but also because the end of a hemispheric rivalry between the superpowers left the global arena without a politics of its own. And this is what gave Al-Qaeda's militancy, together with non-state and non-governmental movements of all kinds, the space in which to operate. So one of the things I want to suggest here is that the end of the Cold War and the disintegration of superpower rivalry is what creates the space for non-state and indeed non-governmental movements of all kinds allows them to work in the, new, in the global arena. It was the loss of geopolitics in a global arena that had, it, it was the loss of geopolitics in a global arena that had been created by the Cold War, in other words, which provided the context for Al-Qaeda's emergence. Neoconservative thinkers in the US had recognized this loss of geopolitics very soon after the Soviet collapse, though they saw it as a sign of America's victorious domination of the global arena. Thus, Francis Fukuyama's celebrated end of history thesis, as elucidated in his 1992 book, The End of History and the Last Man, was the first important statement about America's inability to engage in global politics, now seen as having resolved itself merely into an extension of her domestic conflicts and interests. As you will uh, possibly recall, one of the things that uh, Fukuyama was arguing in his book was that the politics of the future um, would be one in which there was no other horizon but the liberal or neoliberal nation state. Right? And that basically meant that geopolitics um, vanished 
because all international politics would only now become a version of domestic politics. It would just be entities of the same kind interacting with one another. Um, while ostensibly disagreeing with Fukuyama's thesis, Samuel Huntington's equally influential Clash of Civilizations argument, as elaborated in his 1996 book, The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order, also recognized the end of a traditional geopolitics based on states and sought to redefine worldwide conflict in cultural and non-statist terms. For in their own ways, both thinkers saw that with the Soviet collapse, a global arena had come into view that was no longer circumscribed by states or even the international system, and thus did not possess a politics proper to itself. So even though at the time these books were written, Huntington and Fukuyama were seen as, being, as beating the drum of American triumphalism, what I'd like to uh, suggest here is that if you read them today, they seem to be um, uh, more attuned than their leftist critics were at the time to the fact that a certain kind of geopolitics that was familiar to us and indeed created during the Cold War had vanished. Al-Qaeda's emergence then was part of a Cold War narrative and did not signal the beginning of a new historical sequence. Perhaps because it was a transitional phenomenon of this kind, Al-Qaeda seems to have collapsed as a movement enjoying any global support. For it is not the war on terror that has defeated militancy. With the loss of Muslim interest in Al-Qaeda, taking Western security and intelligence agencies by surprise. They won't say it publicly, but they'll tell you privately. Um, indeed, it was precisely because Western governments, led by the US, had gambled on Al-Qaeda representing the beginning of a new historical sequence in global politics that they made such large and long-term investments in the war on terror. And of course, Osama bin Laden did bring something new to the political table. An admirer of Samuel of Huntington's book, for instance, he praises it in one of his communiques, um, he put into action its idea of geopolitics determined by non-state actors. In doing so, he sought to occupy a global arena that had remained politically vacant since the Cold War's division of the planet into rival hemispheres and its nuclear brinkmanship of mutually assured destruction. I mean, just think about this. What the Cold War does is it, it, it puts the globe itself, it makes the globe itself into a political state for the first time, right? And it does this in several ways. By the, uh, uh, by the threat or fantasy of a nuclear apocalypse, mutually assured destruction, right? In which the whole globe is to be, uh, for, for which the whole globe becomes a site. Um, uh, and also by dividing up this globe itself into, as it were, two rival hemispheres, right? So the globe actually becomes a stake in politics during the Cold War. Uh, with the end of the Cold War, the globe still exists, but it no longer has a politics proper to itself, I want to argue. For the new global arena that came into view following the Soviet collapse, now possessed a sociological reality, but no longer a political one. And this new reality, I would like to suggest, has been made thinkable primarily by way of humanity as a figure representing both the object of violence and compassion in the global arena, as well as the potential subject for its future politics. In other words, you know, once you have the globe envisioned as uh, the arena of politics, right, in a, in a quite real, empirically real way, um, both the subject of a global politics and its object um, can be imagined again for the first time um, as the human race itself. Right? So with the rhetoric of mutually assured destruction, nuclear winter, etc., cetera, um, we know that it, you know, it, it's the human race that gets to be the, as it were, victim of this, not just the United States or the Soviet Union, right? Um, and this shift um, to humanity itself as the simultaneous subject and object of a global politics, you see repeated over and over again, even in popular culture. I mean, if you think of, you know, that famous, the example I like to prefer is Neil Armstrong when he first steps upon the surface of the moon. His famous words are, what, one small step, step for uh, man and a giant leap for mankind, right? It's, uh, and those few words actually tell you something quite interesting, that humanity conceived of as a kind of abstraction, man, right? Uh, it's a singular form. 
uh, it's an abstraction. It does not, it does not uh, imply any kind of innumerable entity that we, you know, here's a human race, we can count it up, we know it exists empirically. To mankind, uh, that's, uh, you know, it's an interesting shift. And it also suggests that though he plants an American flag on the surface of the moon, he's speaking, as an American, he's speaking for the human race because his footstep on the moon uh, can, only be, can only belong to humanity itself. Right? It can't simply be confined to the United States. The United States gets to represent the human race. So this is simply a small example of the way in which the Cold War, and the moon landing is part of the Cold War, right? it's part of the race from space and all the rest, uh, actually refigures political agency altogether. Not only does it create the globe, but at the same time it creates humanity itself as the simultaneous object and potential subject of global politics. Right. Now the human race, which had only been an abstraction before the Cold War, suddenly assumed a sinister reality with the possibility of nuclear apocalypse, or indeed the actuality of planetary population control during that period. It therefore became the great subject and simultaneously the true object of the Cold War's new global arena, the one that still enjoyed only a negative existence. After all, how was it possible to represent the human race? You know? um, there no, there's no institution that can do it. Um, modeled on the human race as a new kind of actuality that was supposedly under threat of extinction, the Muslim Ummah, our global community, too emerged during this period as a reality lacking political form. So the point I want to make here is that at the same time that humanity emerges during the Cold War as this subject and object of global politics, so does the Muslim Ummah conceived of as a global community and indeed modeled on the human race, right? which it seeks to represent just as Neil Armstrong sought to represent mankind when he stepped upon the surface of the moon. And if you think of, I am not a scholar of, of early or medieval Islam, but when you think of the way in which this term Ummah or Muslim Ummah had been used in the past, uh, it had never, to my knowledge, uh, been used um, until perhaps the 20th century to refer to an empirically verifiable or enumerable body of people um, uh, who exist globally. Right? It was a metaphysical category. It included people who were dead and people who were yet to be born. So there's a famous tradition attributed to the Prophet Muhammad in which he said, um, uh, he says something of the sort, um, you know, on the day of judgment, I would like, uh, you know, when all the prophets, Jesus, Moses, etc., you know, come together on the Day of Judgment, I would like my followers to be most numerous. Right? So they should be more Muslims than others, than Christians and Jews in this case. Um, but that is, of course, not, an, as it were, a, a, a global idea, right? It, because it includes, well, A, the Muslim community exists globally only at the Day of Judgment after um, the end of the world, and B, it includes people who are yet to be born and people who have already died. Uh, so it's only in this period that it becomes possible to think of the Muslim Ummah as a global category. Right? And as I suggest, the model for this is the human race, um, which comes into existence in this fashion at around the same time. Uh, and people like Osama bin Laden are very clear about this. Right? They're constantly linking the Muslim Ummah and the human race. Um, in doing so, in making this link, it, the Muslim Ummah, came to represent the only political aspiration for a species which had suddenly become depoliticized after the Cold War, one that could now only take a sociological form as the self-same agent and victim of environmental threats like climate change, themselves conceived of in economic rather than political terms. So again, what's interesting is once you get to the end of the Cold War, suddenly the threat ceases to be nuclear uh, war. It now becomes environmental catastrophe on the one hand and pandemics on the other, right? Um, in both cases, you're talking about biological, environmental uh, forms or visions of, of threat um, that are often seen as being more, as it were, uh, economic or due or brought about by economic uh, reasons, exploitation, etc., etc., of the natural environment than political. So in this way, the category humanity is further depoliticized. And again, bin Laden, if you are familiar with his, um, uh, at least some of his um, uh, communiques and statements, uh, was, was assiduous 
in building that link as well. It was constantly, in fact, his last great statement was all about global warming. You might wonder, what on earth was he talking about? What, you know, jihad and global warming, what's going on? Um, but there is a reason for that, and this is it. Unfortunately, you know, so much analysis of militancy is so driven by, as it were, actionable um, uh, results, right? So they, they winnow out, they just simply disregard all the other stuff that's being said in these statements as re mere rhetoric and just zero in on the stuff that is understandable for military or whatever reasons. Uh, but of course this is completely unjustifiable. How do you, re how do you know that this is rhetoric and that isn't? Um, what if it's the military stuff that's actually rhetorical? Um, so to, if you take these statements and communicates as a whole, you come up with quite a different vision of what uh, a person like bin Laden was talking about. So like, a hum like the human race under threat from the environmental catastrophe that had replaced the Cold War's nuclear apocalypse, in other words, the Muslim community both existed and yet could not be said to exist. Uh, so it is no accident that bin Laden very frequently uh, referred very frequently to the Muslim Ummah at, at risk of Western violence in the same breath that he bemoaned the threat of uh, that global warming post for the human race and the equivocal existence of both Ummah and species, not only in Osama bin Laden's rhetoric, but also in our everyday world more generally, serves to foreground the fact that the globe possesses neither political actors nor any institutions of its own. Now let me give you an example, which I think is a very telling one of the way in which this simultaneous existence and non-existence of the category Muslim Ummah, like human race, um, manifests itself. Um, Globalized militancy is one way, but a more interesting way actually is provided by the various upsurges of Muslim uh, mobilization over insults supposed to have been delivered the Prophet Muhammad. And I'm sure you're familiar with these, right? They begin in 1989 with the Rushdie affair, right? The the um, uh, the great um, uh, and that was completely no one had seen anything like it. Right? It was global mobilization across the world. Right? Beginning in England, moving to Pakistan and India, to other bits of the Muslim world, the Ayatollah Khomeini issues his famous fatwa, and it becomes a global cause. All right? Since then, there have been several more of these things. Uh, there has been the Danish cartoon incident, uh, the comments that the Pope made at Regensburg. Um, and those are, in fact, the three big ones. Right? Now, there are many things that can be said about this these movements, but what I find interesting about them is the fact that uh, they are led by no single political party or movement or organization. They seem to, as it were, catch fire from each other, right, through media usage. Um, something of a similar sort has appears to have happened in the, in the Arab Spring for other kinds of reasons. Um, but here you have people who, are, you know, it's not like these things are all planned. They cannot be planned globally. What you seem to have happening is the global Muslim Ummah somehow manifesting itself temporarily and then sinking back down into insignificance. Right? It's almost as if through media, through television, especially with the Rushdie affair, television was the, was the big catalyst there, you have um, this enormous global mobilization, but only temporary. This strikes me as being an example, or these, these three instances strike me as serving as good examples of the way in which the global Muslim Ummah both exists and does not exist. Uh, right. um, uh, people seem to feel that there is such a thing, uh, but it cannot really manifest itself politically or institutionally apart from these very temporary mobilizations. Uh, when we think about the human race, uh, there are a different set of uh, mobilizations, not as extensive perhaps, uh, that come to mind. And these include, of course, um, these great upsurges of uh, philanthropy and charity at global disaster. Right? Think of the Pakistani floods last year. They've recurred again this year because, um, well, for many reasons, not least the, the ineffectiveness of the Pakistani government in dealing with the situation. Um, here you have this extraordinary instance of people um, uh, shaken out of the complacency because of media coverage and willing to give money, large amounts of money, um, to people in far places that they have no other connection with. Right? So 
so humanitarianism of this globalized sort is also a way, uh, is also a form of manifesting, as it were, human solidarity or interrelationships of some kind. Again, temporary, because we know that humanitarian activists are constantly crying out about you know people being hardened, no longer being sensitive to the plight of others, etc., etc., etc. But I think this is built into the category itself, uh, because like the Muslim Ummah, the human race or human solidarity can only manifest itself in these temporary um, ways. Now, the extraordinary politics of speculation and spectacle that Osama bin Laden deployed to lend a kind of reality to such entities as the Muslim community posed neither a political nor indeed a military threat to the United States or any other country, including Afghanistan, despite the great violence associated with it. I mean, you know, Al-Qaeda was not a cred never a credible enemy of the US military or government. It could never overthrow this government. Instead, knew about uh, the militant threat was that it happened to be a it happened to be global without being international, and domestic without being national. As a non-state actor, in other words, Al Qaeda quite evaded the terrain of international politics, becoming a domestic problem for any number of countries, one that could create internal strife, put law and order at risk, and imperil electoral support. Um, imperil the electoral support of governments that were unable to guarantee the security of their citizens, right? So think about this. Um, it's a non-state actor. It doesn't, ex it doesn't, it's not an actor in the international arena, right? It doesn't pose a, a sovereign, it's not a sovereign power to pose a threat to another sovereign power like the United States. Um, so it's not an international threat in that sense. But neither is it, I will argue, a national threat. It doesn't emerge out of the society of the United States only, right? It's domestic. It manifests itself as a domestic threat, and yet it is not national. It's global, and yet it is not international. Um, if its militants did pose a threat to the sovereignty of these countries, then it was largely in the domestic arena, where they broke the state's monopoly over the violence to which citizens might be subjected. And in this sense, the war on terror can also be understood as an attempt by the United States to recover its right to dispose of the lives of Americans as much as the sundry foreigners and homegrown terrorists who threaten them. Um, you know, uh, once American casualties in the war on terror exceeded the number killed in 9-11, um, uh, the left in this country routinely, and they continue to do this, draw that comparison, right? They say, look, here this war was meant to protect Americans, and yet it has ended up killing more Americans than were killed by Al-Qaeda. and such reasoning has very little public effect. Uh, and I suspect, or I would speculate, that one reason why this is the case is because the endangerment of, or the disposal of American lives by the US government is a mark of its sovereignty. Right? Um, uh, it's the endangerment or disposal of American lives by some other power that poses a threat to the sovereignty. Uh, because sovereignty is based on the monopoly of the use of force, right, of violence. Now, uh, yet Al-Qaeda's domestic threat could by no means be adjudged as arising from any national history or conflict, as I said, which is why we have been so keen to trace it to foreign recruiters and training camps in faraway places. Whatever the reality of such long-distance influence, however, it is clear that homegrown militancy was also a reality, and so there were many efforts made to attribute this aspect of militancy to a national politics of racism, discrimination, or even dissent from a country's foreign policy. Um, so if it was difficult enough to characterize militants as being simply people coming from the outside, right, um, as part of some international conflict, it was also difficult to characterize them as being part of a national uh, politics either, right? You know, there were, and there continue to be efforts made to say, well, you know, why would homegrown terrorists be produced in this country? Well, they must have faced discrimination, or um, uh, you know, they must have been um, seduced by some uh, nefarious ideology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. But their focus, the focus of these militants on global issues and distant battlefields, also made it difficult to accommodate these homegrown militants within the circle of national politics. Perhaps it is because the global arena possesses a sociological but not a political reality that it manifests itself in the domestic realm, 
and in doing so deprives it of a national character to produce instead a hybrid or mutant political space within the US. One of the consequences of Al-Qaeda's terrorism, therefore, has been its blurring of the distinction between national and international politics, both of which have lost a great deal of their former autonomy by serving as hosts for a set of new global concerns and practices. Right? So let me repeat at the risk of being redundant here the, the kind of distinction I'm trying to make. Um, Al-Qaeda's militancy cannot be seen either as emerging from a national politics nor from an international politics. It is domestic. It makes, you know, um, remember the 9-11 militants, right? American training schools, American planes, visas, et cetera, et cetera, right? It didn't, as it were, come from the outside. It came from the inside. It was trained from the inside. Um, it was domestic and yet not national. Now, um, the political philosopher Wendy Brown has, in a recent very interesting book, drawn a similar kind of conclusion, though she's not referring to terrorism at all. Um, what she says is that when you look at nation states and nation state sovereignty these days, one of the things you notice that is that the threat to this sovereignty often comes from non-state actors, right? Um, so the great threats are not, certainly in, in Western democracies, are not from other countries. The great threats are seen as coming from contraband, drugs, arms, illegal immigration, a big issue in this country and all over Western Europe, and terrorism, right? All of these are non-state movements or transnational movements. They're not controlled by any country. Uh, they're not, as it were, intentional. It's not like there's some mind that's planning all of this stuff, um, uh, this form of infiltration. So what then becomes interesting is that, you know, if the threat to sovereignty is actually from some group or movement that itself does not possess sovereignty, um, that seems to shake the, the sovereignty of the nation state itself, right? It has to guard against things other than other countries, right? Um, and she further argues, Wendy Brown, that what, what seems to be happening, therefore, is that the, the building of walls and the, the fortifications of borders and the hunt for illegal immigrants or drugs or whatever, militancy, um, is a form of, uh, it creates a kind of fantastical sovereignty, right, which is not related to the international order in any conventional sense. Uh, and one of the consequences of this, she argues, is that um, the sovereignty of the nation state, which had been based from the 17th century, arguably, upon the, the subjection or colonization of the sovereign power of religion on the one hand and as it were capital or financial strength on the other is coming apart. So sovereignty now manifests itself in the global arena precisely in religious terms or in terms of economic reach, right? Both of which go beyond the nation state and its boundaries. So she says that these forms, religion and capital have been decontained, right? Um, they seem to have escaped the reach of the state uh, and as it were returned to their original form. Now, precisely because it, possessed, it possesses no political space of its own, Al-Qaeda's rhetoric and practices had always been drawn from the world of its enemies. For despite the exotic appearance and terminology of its militants, Al-Qaeda operated not as an external enemy, but rather internally, by turning the logic and instruments of the West against itself. This form of assault, as I, as I just said, was in full evidence with the 9-11 attacks whose perpetrators trained at American flight schools and used American aircraft to strike their targets. But the internality of this threat was not merely instrumental. So bin Laden and his acolytes, for example, used constantly to argue that their attacks were only mirror images of Western ones, and in doing so, not only disclaimed any responsibility for them, but also deprived these acts of any ontological weight by rendering them purely negative. Indeed, the only thing they claimed for themselves was the act of martyrdom, which is to say another form of negativity and disappearance that served to represent the equivocal reality of the global arena itself in the form of a cipher. It's actually quite interesting. They claim martyrdom, but they don't claim anything else. Everything else is simply part of the logic of the enemy, which means that they themselves are part of the logic of the enemy. Now, its other and more local claims apart 
the global war on terror can be seen as an effort to externalize Al-Qaeda's global threat by internationalizing it in a conventional war and thus reinforcing both the autonomy of international politics and its separation from that of a national variety. So faced with this curious situation in which you have something that's a domestic threat but not a national one, something that's global but not international, one of the things the United States tried to do was um, re-internationalize, as it were, uh, this conflict, right? And that's what the war on terror, I, I want to argue, attempted to do, among other things. More than a conservative move to protect the international order, however, the war on terror was also an ambitious attempt to remake global politics in the wake of the Cold War. With the United Nations at, as its institutional apex, the international order, of course, had itself been a Cold War artifact, functioning as a kind of force field created by the superpowers and their respective blocs. You know, the UN is formed at the same time as the Cold War begins. Right? Intended precisely to manage and keep global conflict cold, this order allowed for proxy wars in some parts of the world, Indochina, for example, while making for stability in other regions. Thus, a number of amenable dictatorships were tolerated by both superpowers in places like North Africa and the Middle East that are only now being removed due to popular discontent. In many ways, therefore, the remarkable events of the so-called Arab Spring can also be seen as part of the Cold War's undoing. Once the Cold War drew to a close, however, the conflict could no longer be limited to proxy wars and therefore restricted by them, but moved to disrupt even those areas that had previously been stabilized by superpower rivalry. In the initial instance, these new zones of political instability were confined to the former Soviet Union, and it was common to think of what was happening there in terms of the recrudescence of long-suppressed nationalism, whether manifested in its positive form in Eastern Europe and the Baltic, or in its negative aspect of supposedly aged old hatreds in the Balkans, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. But it soon became clear that the mechanistic image of suppressed or even perverted identities reasserting themselves once the Soviet hand was lifted would not do, since even Western client states started behaving in unexpected ways with the effective disintegration of an international order that had been in place from the end of the Second World War. So once the Cold War ends, suddenly things start changing around the world. So a new arms race for nuclear weapons began among second and third rate powers, including India, Pakistan, North Korea, and most recently Iran. But more than this, previously loyal client states suddenly turned against their patrons, Saddam Hussein's Iraq being the chief example. And rather than being coerced into mending their ways by international isolation and the threat of overwhelming force, actually opted to commit political suicide by engaging in hopeless wars with the entire international community. This is extraordinary, this situation. Whether we look at the wars that decimated Saddam's Iraq, Milosevic's Serbia, the Taliban's Afghanistan, or more recently Gaddafi's Libya, striking about all these cases of political suicide is that with the possible exception of the Taliban, all involved the spectacular self-destruction of otherwise opportunistic regimes dedicated to their own survival, right? Surely we cannot attribute such behavior simply to ideological commitment, delusions of power and populist support, or even the lack of any other option, and must consider more seriously how it flouts the very principle of self-interest upon which the international order was built. It is almost as if sovereignty can now manifest itself outside and indeed against this order by claiming not the ability to kill so much as the willingness to die. But in this way, of course, the rogue states that emerged as the international order's solitary enemies after the Cold War were only imitating the United States, whose own vision of global sovereignty prevented it from being bound by the very international institutions it claimed to protect. Um, I mean, we know there's a lengthy history to American exceptionalism. From the League of Nations, which um, you know, was put in place largely due to American insistence, but of course the United States did not join it, um, to the International Criminal Court today, which the United States is also uh, not part of. Uh, the sacrificial sovereignty of such rogue states, however, resembled, that is to say, you know, Libya, Serbia, Iraq, etc., Panama. The first rogue state is Panama, right? Noriega. The sacrificial sovereignty of such rogue states, however, resembled that of Al-Qaeda's martyrs more than it did the power of the United States, 
and in doing so serve to illustrate the coming apart of the international order and its politics of deterrence more effectively than the long history of American exceptionality. So if the Cold War is based on the politics of deterrence, which allows for proxy wars here and there, in the post-Cold War period, deterrence somehow seems not to work in many cases. It's quite extraordinary, right? You have, in effect, suicidal regimes. And I, what I'm saying is that you can't really just say, oh, they were, their backs were against the wall, etc., or they were all fanatically committed to some ideal. I mean, you see uh, Gaddafi's Libya very recently, right? In the, in, the, in the first phase of the revolt against him, he claims that you know, Al-Qaeda is, is fomenting rebellion and all that. Uh, uh, in, this, in, this, in the second phase, he suddenly seems to take the part of Al-Qaeda, right? And, and, and resurrect some kind of Islamic um, form of, of, of loyalty. Uh, so it's perfectly opportunistic. And uh, regimes like that have been opportunistic for decades. Um, why they would choose to commit suicide why they would not, for instance, choose to somehow come to some kind of arrangement, even one that, that uh, meant their own ouster, but that would at least protect the, the country, is the question to ask. And it's not a question that is being asked. It should be asked because Libya is not the only country that does this sort of thing. Right? Serbia, Iraq, Afghanistan, these are all cases in which the regime's concerned knew for a certainty that you could not oppose the entire international order or play one party off against the other there. Uh, there were suicidal missions. And this sort of suicidal nature um, uh, of politics in these places not only trumps the logic of deterrence, the Cold War logic of deterrence, but tells you um, about the contours of a new way of thinking about global politics post-Cold War. Having ceased to constitute a force field between two superpowers, the international order following the Cold War seems to have become as self-destructive as the rogue states that oppose it. For the community of nations now routinely turns against and destroys one of its recalcitrant members in what can only be described as an act of cannibalism, given both the disparity of force involved and the fact that by attacking one of its own, the international community is only weakening itself. For such interventions generally end up creating dysfunctional new states like Bosnia, Kosovo, East Timor, or South Sudan that can survive only as wards of the international order. And in, doing, and in doing all this, the Committee of Nations, represented either by the UN or by NATO, claims to be acting in the name of, you guessed it, humanity. For the species that had possessed only a negative existence during the Cold War, as potentially the victim of nuclear annihilation, has now become the subject of a global politics. Of course, the human race still enjoys no positive reality, but by lending its name to an international order whose politics is increasingly defined by humanitarian considerations rather than some ideological or even merely political rivalry, it has transformed all this order's enemies into figures of the inhuman whose annihilation can be, can be contemplated with equanimity. This is not the international order um, of uh, the Peace of Westphalia, the Treaty of Versailles, any of those things. The idea of battle for humanity has, of course, been important since the First World War, but I would like to argue that its cannibalistic violence only achieved a certain political reality after the Cold War. Now, as in returning to the global war on terror, as an effort to repoliticize the global arena by internationalizing conflict, the war on terror has not only failed, but also damaged the international order even further. Yet this failure is evident not in the fate of Iraq and Afghanistan, so much as in America's domestic politics. For if US administrations during the Cold War were naturally interested in securing America's economic and political dominance, they were also fighting for a vision of the world that was greater than their self-interest. But the collapse of the Soviet Union meant that US geopolitics suddenly shrank to become merely an aspect of her domestic concerns. Is this why every move in the war on terror has been denounced by its critics not simply as bad international politics, but instead as the consequence of purely domestic compulsions having to do with corporate greed and personal vendettas. This also I find highly interesting. You know, from the very beginning of the war in Iraq, uh, the opposition was always, oh, this is all Halliburton, this is all about oil, this is all about. Uh, and in doing whatever the merits of that kind of argument, in making it, what of course the critics of the war on terror were doing was reducing what was purportedly a global international conflict to a domestic, uh, to a set of domestic interests, right? 
that were erasing the distinctions in a similar way that militancy erases those distinctions. Um, however mistaken or irrelevant such accusations may be, they certainly indicate an inability among the administration's critics to distinguish between national concerns and international politics. Her global victory in the Cold War, therefore, has ended up domesticating America's politics so that the nation's greatest enemies could now only be internal ones. Surely the escalating and now unprecedented tension between liberals and conservatives in the U.S., whose mutual hatreds had their origins in the culture wars of the 1980s, demonstrates this truth in full measure. And the internalization of conflict, of course, you see in political language and rhetoric in the United States today, which I believe is unprecedented. America's great power has robbed it of geopolitics as a distinct field of action, confining its practices to the kind of self-interest that is incapable of distinguishing domestic from international arenas. So quite apart from the mutual recriminations of Republicans and Democrats, there is the increasing use of war on terror procedures within the U.S. itself for purposes like crime prevention that restrict the civil liberties of American citizens while having nothing to do with terrorism. We know that you know, the U.S.-Mexico border is now completely uh, invested with um, uh, practices and uh, instruments and technologies from Iraq and Afghanistan, right? Similarly, places within the United States you know, themselves. It is also indicative of this turn inwards that Muslims today are seen by some Americans more as an internal threat than as an external one, with their co-religionists abroad still free to become clients and allies of the U.S., the early years of the war on terror had seen nothing like this rise in what is often called Islamophobia, which has gained ground in the U.S. only after years of uninterrupted security and the absence of terrorist attacks. Again, quite an interesting fact. Linked to this collapse of geopolitics and the blurring of distinctions between the national and the international domains is the so-called birther movement. I'm just putting everything into this as you see. Uh, the birther movement whose adherents hold that President Obama was not born in the U.S. and thus cannot hold office. His grandmother said he was born in Kenya. That's his grandmother. <laughs> I'm glad to learn. Uh, yes. Whatever its other characteristics, surely this widespread belief is indicative of the anxiety created by the vanishing politics of the nation as much as the crisis of the international order because it refuses to make a distinction. Like these domestic concerns that are neither a part of a national nor an international politics, Osama bin Laden's killing, together with the reaction it has elicited, offers us the clearest possible example of America's loss of geopolitics and its withdrawal from the world. And in saying this, of course, I'm doing nothing more than echo the neoconservative thinkers, the ones whom I mentioned, Huntington and Fukuyama. After all, bin Laden could not have been captured alive and handed over to an international court without compromising U.S. sovereignty in the global arena. But neither could he be put on trial in the United States without entirely dismantling the legal procedures regarding enemy combatants and secret evidence that are so central to the war on terror. For a trial, or rather hearing conducted under such procedures, would have had even less legitimacy around the world than that of Saddam Hussein's in Baghdad. And so with neither an institutional... With, and so with neither an institution of national justice available to try Osama bin Laden, nor with an international court as an alternative, Al-Qaeda's founder had to be killed in an action that could not even draw its justification from combat. We have seen that the greatest political consequence of bin Laden's killing, an event that supposedly possessed global meaning, was nothing more than an exaggeration of its merely American character. And you know, um, uh, the president in the run-up of the recent... Uh, 10th anniversary of 9-11 um, uh, had told apparently his, um, his staff to stress the kind of global uh, nature of this attack, all right? that this was not simply an American thing, that it, it had international dimensions. And it strikes me that um, this too seems to be a recognition of the fact that um, with Bin Laden's killing, it was clear that global reaction saw it as an American event. They didn't see it as a global event at all. Uh, and the whole point of the commemoration then had to be to re-globalize it, to re-internationalize it. So the end of the day, uh, bin Laden's demise, which enjoyed only symbolic significance in the rest of the world, served to gain President Obama an all too brief moment of popularity among his own people, having simply become an episode in the domestic politics of the United States. For with the decline of Al-Qaeda's smoke and mirror politics, 
What has come into view is only the inability of states to address the planetary concerns of our time. These include climate change and food security, which the international system seems incapable of grappling with for structural reasons having to do with the limits of its institutional procedures rather than because of any lack of will. And so the global arena remains vacant and deprived of a politics, the very situation that had made Al-Qaeda possible in the first place. Thank you.